There are ants in California with venom so toxic, it rivals the deadliest snakes on planet Earth. In today's video, we're going to introduce California harvester ants, Pagona myrmex californicus. We will detail their traditional usage with Native American peoples in California and dive deep into the science of their hallucination-inducing toxic venom. As always, you can look at the chapter markers down below to hop around, and all the sources are listed inside of the description. If you like this video, if you like all these videos that I'm producing, uh, hey, subscribe, like, comment, blah, 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 do all the things that other YouTubers tell you to do. So let's just hop into it. Like I said at the top of the video, today we're talking about Pagona myrmix californicus. These are also called the California harvester ants, and they exist within the genus Pagona myrmix, which is a fairly large genus. There are around uh, 68 described species found throughout North America. They typically are found in arid regions, so like deserts, for example. And I found out about this group because I was doing a piece, I was about to Today's video was actually going to be about psychedelic animals, uh, animals that have some type of chemicals that can induce a uh, psychedelic experience. And I found this ant, started doing some research, and just fell in love with how incredible it is. So this group is so-called harvester ants because they do harvest seeds for food and store them inside of their colonies. Begonia Miramix has just some incredible ecological associations within an area. Uh, probably the most notable would be that with Phrynosoma species, a uh, horned lizard species. Uh, let me actually pull up a picture of one. But the horned lizards are one of my favorites, Phrynosoma. Uh, they are the cool blood squirting uh, <laughs> lizards that you can find in the American Southwest. And what's really, really fascinating about this group is their relationship with harvester ants. And that relationship has to do with their venom because Pagona Myrmix has one of the most toxic venoms ever recorded in insects. And the way we describe toxicity of venom is through a metric called LD50, otherwise known as lethal dose 50. The way we rank LD50 is through tests by injecting the venom into a host and seeing what percentage of them die at a particular dosage. This is often represented by a graph such as this, where on the x-axis you have the dose, usually milligrams per kilogram, and then you have the percent lethal dosage. So say it's almost never at zero that the dosage is going to be effective, but usually let's say here this is maybe a dosage of 0.5, right? Uh, as dosage increases, going uh, right words on the graph, the percent lethality will increase up until reaching a some dosage where it is 100% lethal. Uh, in order to compare species and compare different venoms, uh, what we do is we look at the LD50, which is this point right here where it is 50% lethal at some dosage. The reason you don't do 100% lethal is because it is a, uh, it's not as clear, uh, like, example, if you have a dosage of 1 versus 2 uh, milligrams per kilogram, you can't compare them if both of them are 100%. So you use LD50 for sakes of comparison. So I found a really awesome list of uh, different venoms, uh, the most venomous snakes in the world on Untamed Science. This is a great way. It just literally has a list of the LD50 as well as the venom yield. You kind of need both of those to determine how deadly an organism is. Uh, if there's an LD50 of one, but they barely produce any venom whatsoever, then it may not kill the organism. So you need to have... Uh, you know, the difference between something poisonous and something fun is the dosage. Pagona Mimrix californicus, the California harvester ant, it has an LD50 of 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, meaning that for every kilogram of body mass that some organism has, you will need 0.6 milligrams of the venom in order to kill half of the specimens. 0.6 on this list ranks equally with the death adder, and it is above species like Waggler's Pit Vipers, Cantils, King Cobras, okay? This ant species has venom more toxic than King Cobra venom. It is absolutely incredible. Now, the problem with this species and the problem with trying to find out more is that there is so little information on what actually makes up their venom. Generally speaking, with venom, it is a collection of enzymes and proteins that have some type of physical response 
on the body. And again, generally speaking, we can divide venoms into four different groups. You have necrotoxins, which kill cells. You have neurotoxins, which affect the nervous system. Uh, this is actually what coral snakes have. And you have myotoxins, which can affect muscles specifically. And then you have hemotoxins, which affect the blood. So generally speaking, most toxins fall into one of those four categories. Unfortunately, I could not find what type of toxin the harvester ants have. Uh, based on some things that we're going to talk about pretty shortly, I think it might be hematoxin, possibly myotoxin, and there could also be some neurotoxic effects as well, but it's all a guess. I just could not find the source. And what's really cool about this, if we're going to loop this all the way back to those uh, phrenosoma, the, the horned lizards, venom often has a force called something Coevolutionary. It is a coevolutionary force, meaning that venom is often highly specifically evolved with another group. So I've mentioned that this venom affects vertebrate mammals. That's what it primarily affects. It actually doesn't even affect insects that much. So these ants that have highly toxic venom that can kill a, a rat, in fact, 12, uh, 12 envenomations, so 12 ants envenomate a Two kilogram rat will kill it, or can kill it, can kill it, not will. That's insane. 12 bites can kill a rat. Insane. 12 stings can kill a rat. Insane. And it's believed that it's so toxic so that it's a defense mechanism, or it can be used to actually kill and consume those prey. But uh, they're harvester ants, they mainly collect seeds, so I, I don't think it's as much of the, the predation angle. Uh, but, again, that's only with vertebrate mammals because in species like the horned lizard is actually believed that they might be in a co-evolutionary arms race and what that means is that the ant venom is getting more and more toxic over time because they're trying to uh, actually envenomate these horned lizards and maybe affect them in some way but the horned lizards are completely immune to it uh, nothing occurs to them if they get bitten by these ants if they get stung by these ants um so it, it's 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 a really interesting and this is a super common pattern that we do see uh, in other organisms as well this is commonly noted in rattlesnakes and rats uh, or rodents in general where they get more immune uh, and it is seen in many many other toxic species where there's this uh kind of yeah an arms race to either get more venomous and then get more immune to the new venoms and it just keeps going on and on and on and on until you get a uh, highly venomous species uh, that deserves a whole video in its own right uh, and we will definitely do that at some point and but now but now I want to migrate over to the very fascinating uses of California harvester ants in indigenous communities in Southern and Eastern California, I believe also Central California. So I came across this paper. Uh, it is Ritual and Therapeutic Use of Hallucinogenic Harvester Ants, Pagona Myrmix, in native South Central California. And I was absolutely blown away. So there is not much information that I can find here. Uh, some of the best summaries are uh, this paper from Kevin P. Uh, Groark, Groark uh, from UCLA, and he had a follow-up publication in 2001 confirming that the taxa used is probably the California harvester ant and not another species of Pagona myrmex. But what they found is this species was used by 17 different indigenous communities uh, for either ritualistic or medicinal uses. Some of the noted groups include the Chumash, the Kitanamuk, and the Kawaiasu. Hopefully I'm pronouncing all that right. I tried my best. Um, but it is often uh, tied to, again, ritualistic and medicinal uses. Um, the medicinal uses range from everywhere from curing uh, diarrhea, arthritis, uh, as well as uh, various musculoskeletal things. I I'll put it underneath that umbrella, like uh, broken bones, heart muscles, stuff like that. Um, but I was really fascinated with the ritualistic use. So uh, across several different cultures, again, we're, we're kind of generalizing a lot. There's, I would definitely dive deeper into the paper and doing your own research for what individual groups actually do with this. Uh, but generally speaking, it is used to form connections with dream helpers. These are uh, spiritualistic, shamanistic uh, 
helpers that can confer them shamanistic powers, uh, as well as bring, uh, there was a lot of note that this is actually used to bring peace because uh, there used to be a lot of fighting. And then after this use of ants, uh, there is not as much fighting instead. Yeah. So uh, again, read the papers. They go into a lot more depth and I, I don't want to don't want to generalize too much. Um, but across these groups, it, it is very known that these harvester ants have that deep connection with these rituals. And basically, the, the venom is described as intensely painful. It lasts several hours. It feels like muscles or tendons are ripping, or you're turning a screw into the flesh of the sting site. And this is very curious because they're not just getting one or two stings. What they're actually doing is ingesting the ants live. And various rituals will have them ingest 250 up to 450 ants. Uh, that is just based on some rough estimates, 250 to 450, is uh, seeming to be the ritualistic dosage. And I, I'm just going to say here, please please do not do this. Please do not go out and have a fistful of, harv of harvester ants. Um, one, you might actually get the wrong ants, and you might get Argentine fire ants, which are wiping out harvester ants, uh, and you do not want that. Uh, you probably also don't want this. Usually what would happen is after ingesting several hundred ants, they would uh, lose consciousness and have a deep death-like sleep. During that state, that is when the dream helpers would choose the boy. This is often a coming-of-age ceremony for a few different groups, um, but it can also just be for shamanistic or medicinal purposes. Um, and again, there is not much information on what exactly is going on in the toxicology. Uh, Again, they would lose consciousness, go into a deep death-like state. Actually, at this dosage, if you consume 450 ants and assuming that every single one of them uh, injects venom, you're actually at an LD35. Uh, so it's 35% it's fatality for a 100-pound person. That, that's it's, LD35 is not technically correct. Uh, the venom is has 35% fatality for a 100-pound person. Um, but there is actually lots of preparation that goes into this ceremony. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Uh, essentially, before consuming, participants would abstain from meat, salt, grease, and blood, while also observing fasting and nightly vomiting to purify the body. This would go on for several days. Uh, it is believed that the ants are hostile towards blood and would visit harm to those who had it. This is also why it's usually not, uh, this ceremony was not being used with uh, menopausal uh, women. So uh, essentially, this is a long ceremony. It is carefully watched by ant doctors, as uh, that's what they were called in these papers. Um, and the participants would have deep hallucinations. Uh, they would go unconscious for several hours, three to four hours, wake up, and then they would regurgitate. They would actually drink uh, lots of hot water to regurgitate the ants out. Often the ants were still alive. Of course, because they're alive, they are biting you as you go down. They're biting the insides of your stomach and your intestines, which is what gives you this loss of consciousness, deep uh, hallucinations. But when I was reading this paper, uh, this this 30-page uh, report by Grorark, I, I really highly recommend it. I think it's a great starting point, um, and you can go and go into the various branches like I did. Um, what they found is, well, he, he hypothesized that there were two reasons why these hallucinations are occurring. Again, we do not have full toxicology of what compounds are in their venom, so it's very difficult to say what's going on. Uh, one option is, of course, that they do indeed contain psychoactive compounds. That is, you know, like, uh, like other groups of animals that contain psychoactive compounds, it's typically some form of DMT uh, or DMT-like substances, so, of course, a deep psychedelic. But it is actually... Grark says that this might actually be a case of uh, psychoactive responses via ant poisoning. And here's the thing. Before they consumed it, and they would abstain from the, the, the meat, the grease, the blood, the salt, everything like I said, this will actually put your body into a fatigue-like state. They are fasting and purging their body, leading to low glucose levels, which can actually starve the brain. And it decreases degradative enzyme productions. So the digestive enzymes uh, would not be produced as fully because of the fasting and the purging, so the ants are more likely to survive. This would also make you more susceptible to a hallucinatory state. 
So this is where it gets super, super fascinating because there, there are plenty of uh, reports about how this works. I found this paper, Spirit, Mind, and Body in uh, Chumash Healing, which was really great. It talked about many other things, and they did have a paragraph on the red harvester ants. The Chumash people pronounced it, I believe it's pronounced Shu Tulhal for these uh, ant species. That was uh, that That is their name for them. Uh, but again, it might be that they are putting themselves in a fasted state, which makes them susceptible to more or less uh, starvation-induced uh, hallucinations that are aided through ant poisoning. Uh, regardless of the, is it psychoactive or not, or is it uh, a result of starvation, it, it is absolutely true that they do hallucinate and they do have very deep hallucinations so i i just really wanted to share this i i think it's absolutely incredible uh the ceremonies are often one time but they can do it multiple summers multiple years until they have multiple of these uh dream helpers or in a few cases they do it over multiple days where they would uh wake up and then consume more ants go back into that death-like sleep wake up again and then so on and so forth, uh, until they and the ant doctor um, in these various cultures have decided that that is enough. So it is a very, very fascinating thing. And I just want to share it with you today because these harvester ants are so cool and they hit on so many different elements of venom, of culture, of uh, just, just coolness. So if you like this video, let me know down below, leave a comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. If you're watching to the end, you're a legend, you're cool. Uh, so later biologists, I will see you soon. <laughs>